You're listening to the Michael Harding podcast and the first reading I did on the previous audio, audio for this weekend was from Staring at Lakes and I talked a little bit about it. Now I'm going to read you directly from the book one full section. I hope you like it. It's called In the Bleak Midwinter and it's from Staring at Lakes. It was a title I got. It's a phrase in the book. When you end up staring at lakes. To me, it's an image of men of a certain age when they're kind of battle-scarred from inner conflict, from depression or from some sort of wound. And they're just sitting there looking out, looking out the window or looking at the lake or whatever, staring at lakes. I hadn't realised that things were so bad until I ended up in hospital, sitting in a wheelchair, drinking a jug of pink liquid and waiting to be wheeled into a CT scanner. They wanted to find out if the blood coming from my back passage was a sign that I had bowel cancer. It wasn't. I had colitis, a gross irritation of the bowel wall, probably caused in my case by an overuse of antibiotics. If I was lucky, it might be a one-off attack. If I wasn't, then I might have a debilitating condition for the rest of my life. A nurse told me that the trauma of sudden illness could sometimes induce depression, and so it did. In the months that followed, my usual melancholy transformed into a swamp of sorrow, an ocean of grief, oozing from the pores of my skin and constricting me in what strung-out jazz musicians might call the blues. At the end of July, my wife brought me home to Leitrim in my own jeep, like a broken Don Quixote, where I began recuperating, surrounded by windmills in the hills above Loch Allen. All day, I sat in a chair on the patio and stared at the lake and the shoreline. The dishwasher was still in the kitchen and my wife still filled it to bursting point before putting it on, but it didn't seem important to me any more. In fact, nothing seemed important as the leaves fell from the trees and autumn began to close in. Apart from the fact that I woke up exhausted each morning, unable to get out of bed and dreading any encounter with other human beings. Each evening I waited for darkness to descend. For supper I poured myself a bowl of cornflakes and drenched them with milk and sugar. I brushed my teeth, folded my shirt on the back of the chair and lay down on the bed. By then it was already dark outside. Sometimes the neighbour's dog barked. Clouds drifted across the mountain bringing rain that pelted the roof and reminded me that I was in Leitrim. Sometimes I rose and sat by the window, my head boiling, my body hot and foggy, my bladder full and yet unable to entirely empty, and I'd sit there almost overwhelmed by the vastness of the obscure universe beyond the clouds. And it was then, at night, that the obscure universe within me also made its presence felt. A formless black hole, churning and swelling like an ocean. For me the ground of all being was black, and it was that blackness I waited for, while the rest of the house was sleeping. Even during the day I was ambushed by sadness. It gnawed at my emotions, like a demonic bird come from the deep to pluck me to pieces. I joined a leisure centre with my wife in a local hotel and we drove to it every morning. I'd splash about trying to swim and sometimes I got weak in the sauna. She insisted that exercise would help and I didn't disagree. To cheer myself up, I went to see the Pulitzer Prize-winning poet Paul Muldoon reading poems in the dark in Carrigan Shannon in late July. 
He was wearing a linen jacket over a black V-neck sweater, and he was a bit like a bird himself as he darted about the room from one poem to another, his long hair falling in a mop of curls over the same bright and brilliant forehead that I had first seen almost thirty years earlier in Sligo at the Yates Summer School. In those days, Muldoon didn't dart about, he just stood intensely still at the podium in a suit and tie, his fringe falling over his spectacled eyes as the audience sat on beanbags and leaned against the wall, because it was fashionable back then to spurn anything as bourgeois as a chair. But Muldoon looked well after all the years, a bit plump in the tummy, but lighter in himself as he pounced, as he pronounced each lovely word as if he had just invented it. The reading was an absolute pleasure, and I left the building content, but as soon as I drove home, and for no apparent reason, the ocean of misery inside me threw up black, beaky demons again, to shred my peace of mind. I couldn't explain it, or fathom the reason, but any ordinary moment of pleasure, like listening to poetry, or buying an ice cream at the filling station, could be suddenly flittered away by the savage presence of inner sadness. On the first week in August, Frank arrived. A small, squat man in his sixties, he was married to my wife's sister, and she asked him to help us put in a stove in a room that looked out on the patio and was rarely used in winter. Having a stove in it would give us much-needed extra space in the small cottage. It took him two days, so he stayed overnight and went to the pub with my wife. I heard them return and make sandwiches in the kitchen, and I envied Frank his health and cheerfulness as I watched him the following morning eating a hearty breakfast before she drove him to the station. Shortly after Frank had put in the stove, another brother arrived, Tom, from London, with bottles of ale, which he called Bishop's Fingers. At almost seventy he was in poor health, and he sat in a rocking chair on the patio for two days with a rug around him, because he smoked a lot, and he didn't want to smoke in the house. For many years he had worked in the office of a factory that produced asbestos and his lungs were destroyed and to come home on the ferry had been a big effort but he wanted to sit in the hills above Loch Allen with his sister perhaps for one last time and look down at the shoreline where he and his father had once spent a splendid happy day. I can still remember the sandwiches we ate at the waterside that afternoon, he said. He struggled for breath and stared at the lake and smoked his cigarettes in silence, and I wondered what flock of birds was eating his heart out, or what ocean of black terror awaited him every night. I asked him if he slept well, and he just said, I was up every hour. When he was leaving, he walked to the taxi on his own, gripping his walking stick, with the rug still draped over his shoulders. It was obvious that he wouldn't last much longer. He bid me farewell, a last farewell, with his raised hand as he got into the car and the car drove away, and all evening I sat by the stove and looked out the patio door at the empty chair rocking slightly in the breeze, and I saw a big crow land on the chair and turn its head sideways and gawk at me through the glass, just like an old friend. Some nights I examined myself in the toilet. I spent hours evaluating my stool, my water, and my general complexion in the mirror. Not that there was anything remarkable about my body, it was more or less the same as anyone else's. 
I was six foot tall. I had the usual appendages and accoutrements and orifices that you might expect in the body of a male human from this neck of the European woods at this particular time in history. From an anthropological point of view, I was as textbook a specimen as any ant, except that I was bigger than an ant, and I had hair in my nostrils and in my ears and under my arms and in my lower body. The muscles on my upper arms and chest had withered, and my flesh was as white as a sheet in a mortuary. I had no muscle left to speak of. I was a skeleton with flabby skin. The male organ looked as sad as a dead hen's neck. I would run my finger over my back and underarms looking for blotches, moles or other carbuncles that might be cancerous. I examined my scrotum, which looked like a bag of worms with purple veins bulging and there under the skin, and I made a general assessment of the smell, not just the smell of the body, the general body. All things about me seemed to reek of death. Sometimes when a young woman got into the pool at the leisure centre, her perfume would hover over the water for a few moments, and swimming through it was delicious, and I wondered if the opposite was the case with me. Did I leave behind me everywhere a scent that other people found repulsive? But no matter how long I spent examining myself, I was never going to find the cause of my despair, because my wounds were all on the inside. Colitis was on the inside. An enlarged prostate that blocked me from urinating was on the inside. Though even these were bearable afflictions, the core problem was my negative mind. I would stare at myself in the mirror and accuse myself of having fucked up everything. I told myself that even the spiders in the bath were happy compared to me. Eventually they achieved their full potential. They all got out of the bath and made webs on the ceiling in the corners, whereas I had failed. And the ultimate failure was the failure of the body. I couldn't stay out of bed for more than a few hours. In the sauna, I couldn't stay more than five minutes. I couldn't eat. I couldn't piss. I couldn't think without being overwhelmed by negative emotions. I had failed at everything. I was a failed husband, a failed priest, a failed writer. The list was endless, as endless as the night was long, and the mirror had an image in it, and the image did not disagree with me. As a teenager, I had shaken my guts out for years to the sound of the show bands in dance halls around Cavan and Longford. It was my, o my only option in an unconscious world, though even then I fancied that my body glided around the slippery floors with the grace of Rudolf Nureyev or the carnality of John Travolta. And for years I harboured the delusion that my feet and toes were as pretty as a little girl's until I took off my sock one night at a party and the girl I was with screamed in horror. I flailed away in the gym for years to avoid a beer belly until an older man laughed at me one day in the dressing room when he caught me glancing at myself sideways in the mirror. I think you've lost, he said, and so I had. But it's hard to believe that I could lie awake for hours, envying John Travolta or a Russian ballet dancer and the spiders in the bath. And since it would be hard to believe that someone could actually stand before a mirror for hours in the middle of the night, nursing a kind of irrational contempt for his own body and for his own life's history, I never told anyone what was going on. How did you sleep? My wife would inquire in the morning. Oh, not too bad, I'd reply. 
When I was in bed, I stayed awake and clung to the pillow. I clung to an old vest as if it were a worry blanket and I was a child in a cot. Sometimes I would visualise the face of the old Tibetan Lama in West Cavan with whom I had studied ten years earlier and sometimes that helped me sleep. But if I did sleep it was only for a, an hour or so. Even on moonless nights when a heavy blanket of cloud and rain smothered Leitrim in a dark, damp stillness, I couldn't sleep. I would greet the dawn wide awake as I lay there exhausted, still surf surfing across memories of life in Mullingar and the fun and excitement of being on the road with a theatre show and my unrelenting quest for love in random central stores. A life that had crashed to smithereens in a few weeks, and left me in despair. In the spring of 2011, when the tour of The Tinker's Course was in full swing, I was invited onto a radio programme in Dublin to promote the show. I remember seeing a mink on my way to the train that morning, black and shiny, its gorgeous coat far superior to even the most beautiful black cat I ever had. It was running across the road that leads down to Loch Ennell, where the swans live. There was something about its wild nature that I envied. That night I was on the radio with two other people, a young man and a woman, both of whom are known as entertainment journalists. We were going to talk about movies. When the programme began, I tried to sound as if I knew something about Hollywood. Apparently Sandra Bullock is having personal problems, I declared. But everybody knew that already. The young man beside me explained how the movie under review was not very good and, and was the same as half a dozen other movies and how the storyline was silly but that Sandra looked good. If you like Sandra, he said, you will like this movie. He sounded as if he knew her intimately. The presenter was just off a plane from New York and he was sporting an impressive tan. The young woman on the panel was all giggles, like Marilyn Monroe, on the verge of ecstasy, as if this was the happiest day of her life. I just didn't know enough about movies and I couldn't keep up with the eloquence of the other two. I was amazed by how much they knew about celebrities and by all the hot gossip they had about Hollywood. At one stage I asked them if there was any danger that we might be losing the run of ourselves and that perhaps our over-familiarity with American culture was a sign that we were as a nation still colonised. They looked at me as if I had two heads. I left the studio a bit dazed and wandered into a nearby pub. A young woman in gothic evening wear was leaning against the bar and holding her head like she had a migraine. I asked her if anything was wrong. She said she'd been in the back of a taxi and she'd heard an old geezer on the radio trying to say something intelligent about movies. The old fart probably wasn't at a movie for decades, she said. He was going on about being colonised or something. He said he was from Mullingar, wherever that is, probably on planet Zog. No, I said, Mullingar's in Westmead. It's an hour away on a train. How do you know, she asked. The fart on the radio was me. Jesus, she exclaimed, that's cool. We didn't have much of a vocabulary in common, so I tried to use words judiciously. When she asked me if I would like to join her for a drink, I said, that'd be cool. And then the drinks arrived, my wine and her vodka, which is when she realised that she'd left her money in the taxi. She was all distressed about that, so I paid, and she thanked me, and I said, don't worry, it's cool. Then, for the sake of conversation, I said that I'd seen a sleek black mink that morning on the road to Loch Ennell, where the swans live. 
and that it was utterly wild and beautiful. She stared at me with some unease and said, You're really off the wall, man. She said it without mercy or humour. I know, I said, I know. She meant it. And I had a sense of foreboding at the time that had only been a few months earlier. Now, I was standing in a bathroom in Leitrim, staring at the mirror. It was 3 a.m. Off the wall, man, she said. I knew now what she had meant. Right. Well, I hope you... I hope you like that. And it's a rolling piece, I suppose, what I'd call a rolling piece. You know, when you're writing, I find it's very, very, very problematic if you stick with a logic. You know, you, you have a logical or psychological plan and you follow it. It makes writing very boring. What I find is helpful is when you move laterally from one thing to another. And so when I look back on that piece, I'm talking about being in the bathroom, examining my body. I'm talking about two beautiful men, Frank and Tom, who who came to visit at that time when I was very vulnerable. And I could see in one of them how he was far more fragile than I was. Always, always remember him sitting on the patio, smoking a cigarette and staring at the lake. And him knowing in himself how vulnerable he was you know, barely able to sleep at night. And then the other man, Frank, perfectly lovely, jolly human being, relishing both the fun of music in the pub at night and the fry in the morning and not knowing that within three months his life would be over. To me, those two men were like do you know the way angels come or prophets from, you know, the Old Testament appear, you know? That's what they were like to me, looking back on it. Their, their presence bore witness to the shortness of life and the equanimity that you need when you have ill health. And so that, that's the message I got from them. As I went forward, staring in the mirror with my own depression. But it's nice to, to tell stories like that and then to slip into other things. Because the, the overall, I suppose the overall thing I was trying to do in that sequence was show how isolated that I became or that a man can become through illness or trauma or, or loads of other things. but and, and there's also a sense, I bring it up at the end, and it's a, you know, I bring it up for the fun of how I met that young woman in Grogan's, it was, in fact. And she just heard me on the radio. A great coincidence, but it, it just shows you how isolated somebody gets, a man gets particularly as he gets older. Men in Leitrim in the old days could become very isolated. Men still do become very isolated in old-fashioned areas and rural areas. But I sense that in urban areas too, and even in families or nursing homes, sometimes men can carry an intense loneliness or isolation inside them. And some of that is to do with, you know, the contemporary issues of politics, how, you know, the, the discussion about gender, masculine, feminine, toxic masculinity, patriarchy, all the negative things that a man can feel he belongs to and needs to take ownership of, even though he might have lived a very gentle life and, and never been in power or never been privileged, and yet yet he can become burdened by those things. And, and then there's nowhere to go because there's no collective public expression of faith. We live in a very secular world now in the West. 
I know it's not very secular, maybe that's an exaggeration, but there there is an ambient, there's a there's an ethos there at the moment which is materialist. Maybe that's the best way to say it. So there's no consolation. And that, that's all very dark stuff, so I hope I'm not depressing you because there's good news coming. Like, really, really positive is that the last 10 years have been a revelation for me. The last 10 years have been a growth experience for me. The last 10 years have been a wonderful time. I was blessed that I got depressed. I was blessed and lucky that I was struck down with an illness 10 years ago because I learned a lot from it and from all the various you know, health issues that have arisen since. And they don't seem so surprising now that you come to a certain age into your late 60s, you realise, well, yeah, this is, I suppose, this is what happens, isn't it, as you get older? Um, what's the big deal? What's the fuss about? So I've tried to do two things in that. One is to do about writing, and I share it with people because I think it's it's an important way to to use these podcasts as kind of creative writing uh, pathways and I find that telling a story which is your own personal story is very powerful but when you go into memory when you go into your past yesterday you'll find there's an option and it can be very easy to track a path which is negative in the in the long run I don't think that does you any good I think we're we we desperately need storytellers to remind us of what is beautiful in the world, in the sky, to be honest. At this time in history, in the West, we need beauty. And it's interesting that beauty is nearly always universally agreed on. There's there's nobody who disputes what beauty is. It's almost as if beauty in itself is the fingerprint of, of, of a greater consciousness. That there's a truth in beauty. And I think that they're the stories that you need to be telling. And the value of doing that for me has been over the past ten years writing those six books... The value of it is it has worked worked me into a space not just where I'm writing beautiful stories but I'm beginning to use narrative in my life to be a yeah, to be a happier person, I suppose. I stalled there because I know up to ten years ago I, I just would never use the word happy like who wants to be happy? And people make a, a distinction between, well, it's better to have meaning in your life than happiness. And that's true, but I think that once you get the meaning, the happiness is the consequence. I am happy because I have meaning. And my meaning is to do with some internal forum. It's, it's to do with some interiority, some complete sort of cosmology that's on the inside in my heart there's a room in the room there are mentor deities there's a, a whole kaleidoscope of of deities and saints and angels and presences and I, I add to them daily this is not canonical religion this is the work of the imagination not in one sense to do with institutional religion totally to do with your imagination that you can activate your mind in a way that creates, visualizes internal presences. And that these mythic presences, they may reflect a deeper metaphysical truth. They may reflect a really deep metaphysical truth about the cosmos. But at least from a human perspective, from the human point of view, from your side, not from the God side, but from your side as a human being, the dynamic of living on the inside, using the faculty of imagination to freely celebrate relationality between yourself and the, the mentor deity or the mythic saint or whatever, this is a beautiful dynamic. And 
rather than take you away from the world, it's the very thing that actually seems to work like a lens that once you once you focus it inside you, there's some dynamic happens whereby you become probably you become more conscious of yourself in the room. So so you become more conscious of being present in the present moment. The kingdom of God becomes now, becomes present. So there you go, you go into the heart, into that room, into that space, inside. And then the dynamic of prayer, of visualizing relationship with a mentor, a deity, or a saint, or an ancestor, or a grand uncle, Believing that they hold you, that they embrace you, that, that the Virgin Mary enfolds you in her tenderness. Believing all that stuff. In whatever religious tradition, but believing it is a dynamic that allows you realize you're in the room ooh, in, in a, a beautifully intense, conscious way. That's what it does. That's what excites me. And as I say, perhaps... Perhaps the, there is a, a deeper metaphysical truth to all that. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not going to be bothered about it. I'm already in heaven. There being a deeper metaphysical heaven, I don't know. But I know that my, my mother is just beyond my fingertips. I know that I am embraced by, by the saints. I know I'm not alone in the room. And the dynamic of going on to the inside to experience relationship with the invisible is the very thing that propels me into the room in a more real way to be more present that's a journey that I couldn't that I've made that I couldn't have made it without the illness because as Rumi says the wound is where the light comes in and it's not that I'm glad that that I am sick or was sick but I do recognise the wound is where the light comes in and that I wouldn't have been able to speak like this ten years ago because I was still just burdened by the existential emptiness within. I, I hadn't... I, I'd filled it as a child. I, I grew up with faith. I grew up with a sense of the interior, with a mentor deity on the inside. And it was beautiful. And, and it was, I thought, the path and way to go, which is what led me into the priesthood. And... And that all was beautiful, except that, that it seemed to clash with the mundane world around me. And it seemed that, you know, to follow that path any further w was unacceptable because it was too institutional, it was all male, it was exclusive, it was patriarchal. On and on with the negative problems with it. So I said, well, I just want to be a writer and a storyteller, so I'm getting out of here. And I went off and I spent my life doing what I wanted to do, which was a storyteller. But funny Without those illnesses over the past 10 years, I wouldn't have come around to recognising that the existential emptiness within, that melancholy within, that sorrow within, needs to be filled. And, and maybe I see it from a, a masculine point of view that, that when the very idea of masculinity is under such assault in the world, then all the more reason why a man would need some sort of inner strength, some sort of prayer life. And I know we're living more and more now in a, in a world where I don't think that's going to be the case because if you don't teach children to pray, they won't know how to pray. If you don't teach them to play the flute, they won't have music from a flute, you know. You want, a fellow advised me one time, if you want the child to play an instrument, have an instrument in the house and play it, then she'll play it. He was right. But it's the same with prayer, so. So I don't know what the next generation of men will be like and how, how the kind of negative critique of masculinity will have got more intense. I don't know how men will be able to stand up. 
and feel good. Especially if they haven't any sense of an inner faith. I'm not I'm not a scholar. But I just wanted to read some Staring at Lakes passages this weekend and I hope you like them. And um next week I go on to the the book I wrote after that, which was Hanging with the Elephant. A book deeply about my mother and the sense of grief when you lose somebody like your mother. Uh, That's for next weekend. And thank you for being here. Bye-bye.